Hello everyone and welcome back to day 18 of Bitwise where we make the complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. So um, as of last stream, um, I did a, uh, a walkthrough of some stuff that had happened over the weekend, laid out plans for the, this week, gave some homework, and then started uh, in the mainstream a little bit on, um, on working on an Ion library. Uh, and, uh, not, not the compiler, but rather something using Ion um, in a hopefully eventually useful way. Uh, and then in the extra stream, we did a bit of extra work. The extra stream was not very long that day, but we got some basic stuff working. Um, and uh, the rest of that day, and also yesterday, I mostly were f focused on fixing bugs in Ion itself because I, got, I found a bunch of things and got a bunch of reports. And I also focused on implementing features that I needed in order to make the glue code we started working on much cleaner. So I think I alluded that I wanted to do that before I did much more work on the library itself. And so I did that yesterday. And so um, before we get into continuing work on that library, I want to review the some of the, some of the bug fixes or changes that were made, but also specifically focusing on things that are related to making that kind of binding code uh, cleaner and less redundant. Um, so first, let's just uh, quickly look at the diffs uh, just to see what happened since last time. Uh, it's mostly just bug fixes, which are I'm not going to go into. Um, uh, one small thing feature-wise is that consts, like not const qualified types, but const declarations can now be pointers, which is, is works fine in C if you use pound defines as well. Um, and I I did this because I wrote this little hypothetical UART memory mapped I/O example, and I realized that when you're doing this kind of code for for I don't know, drivers uh, for embedded platforms or just operating systems, you quite often want to be able to have hard-coded pointer constants. And I mean, these could be variables rather than constants, but I just thought it would be nice to have those. And it works well with C anyway. So uh, you now have pointer constants if you want them, can be useful for this kind of embedded code. Um, uh, a fairly uh, substantial change is that I expanded support for notes. So notes are these annotations <clears throat> that you can put on functions. Um, previously, we just had this, uh, we just had the ability to put a simple tag on declarations or specific, no, I guess all declarations. Um, and the idea is they were, they were intended to act like adjectives. So they don't, you know, they're not like metaprogramming directly in the sense that they, you know, as their encounter, they necessarily invoke a macro or some kind of metaprogramming mechanism or whatever. They're really just intended as declarative uh, annotations. And then different parts of, well, either the compiler itself in some cases like this, but also your own application can interrogate that in, and interpret it in its own way. That was sort of the intention. Um, so but previously, you could just have a single name tag. Now you can actually put... Um, you can actually put like arguments, optional arguments on it. And each of the arguments is basically like a function call, except the arguments can be named optionally. Um, from, from the rest of the compiler's perspective, it basically just makes an AST. It doesn't do anything with the AST. So it, it, um, the arguments have to be expressions, but it doesn't interpret them. It doesn't type resolve them. It just gets you the raw AST. And then the specific handling code uh, for a given type of note can do its own validation and parsing of that AST. Uh, and typically, that would never involve any type checking. It would just be, you know, oh, this thing is a name. This thing is a quoted string. I'm going to do something with it. Um, but anyway, so that was added. That extension was added. And in addition, uh, I added what I guess maybe should be called directives. Um, but it, the way I think about it is that while these uh, at uh, notes are like adjectives in the sense that they attach themselves to existing declarations, these pound notes are uh, kind of global directives. So it's, you know, this looks like a C pound include or something like that. It's intended to have that uh, evocation um, where, you know, it's it's not attaching itself to the next AST node or anything like that. It's just occurring there. Uh, and it actually, is, it's, it's a standalone AST node. So rather than being attached to another AST node, it's just a declaration that's called a note declaration. Um, and so right now, the only way I use it is for these foreign includes, where uh, previously, if you remember, we had, uh, we still have some stuff in there, but um, th we had this preamble, and the preamble used to just have hard-coded the things we knew we wanted in our test cases, like standard I.O. and math.h. Um, but now, 
each library that has a foreign function or foreign whatever um, can now have a pound include. And um, this is then synthesized essentially along with all the other includes at the top of the generated file. Uh, and so for example, if you look at test two, which is where the math library stuff is, you can see we have these foreign declarations for the functions, but we also have uh, the pound include to go along with it. Um, I, soon I want to be able to also specify like the library uh, and maybe it will be like, I don't know, um, you know, libm or something like that. Like, I don't, I don't know what the notation will be, but basically I want to be able to do something along the lines of pragma comment lib um, foo.lib on Windows, where when you do these foreign bindings, you can not only specify the include, but you can also specify the library and, and in some way that um, uh, distinguishes by platform. So for example, in the case of math.h on, uh, on Windows, all the math functions are built into the default CRT, but on Linux, you need to link with libm, right? So that sort of thing. Um, but that's not supported right now. Right now you have to manually know to link against those dependencies, but that's the kind of thing I want to do with this mechanism uh, soon. But yeah, so that was added and uh, already that made things a little cleaner and more self-contained. Um, the big change though, maybe I'll skip ahead in the commit list just to uh, to address this and let's, let me just see if there's, yeah, this is actually all kind of related to that. Um, compared to last time, the big change is that I now have complete for support for incomplete declarations, um, at least for certain types of declarations like structs and, and unions and um, um, and so on, uh, functions notably. So previously you remember we had this kind of, we had to do a dummy uh, thing for these. First off for foreign functions, you can now just have an incomplete definition like this, just like in C, where basically it provides the, it provides a simple table entry, but it doesn't provide the actual definition. And especially for foreign functions, that's always what you want. Um, but even for non-foreign functions, you can now do these incomplete definitions. And the meaning of this is much like C is basically, you know, this thing is going to be defined somewhere, but not here. Uh, and it, when you're using the C code generating backend, uh, what this basically means is, um, if you look at like update, it means that we get a declaration of the function in the header with the, the, the type that we specified, but we don't have a definition to go along with it. So it sort of assumes that, you know, the, the linker, if you will, will take care of it. And by the linker, I really mean for us, since we're using C code on the back end, it really means the C code, right? Like some, some other part of the build chain will, will take care of providing definitions. Um, but what this means is, um, you know, you can do it this way and it just kind of works. Uh, you don't have to do stubs and you do get the declarations in the C file. Um, all right. Um, the other big thing, um, oh, right. So, so let me give you an example of the struct window. I mean, it's just like in C, but let me just uh, make, make it explicit. Um, this is an incomplete type. So just like in C, we can have pointers to it, right? Um, actually, let me show you the error if you do it wrong. So uh, this all works, no errors. If I try to do something like um, bar window val, uh, it's going to say this is an incomplete type. So um, that kind of thing is not allowed just like in C, but you can't have pointers to it and, and so on. So that's the idea. So, so this lets you have you know opaque types from third-party libraries uh, as long as you don't ever need to dereference them yourself. So uh, standard opaque type idiom, but uh, now we support that for binding to foreign code. Um, the um, the other thing that was kind of a problem in the stream we did yesterday or whatever Monday, Monday for me, Sunday for for you as viewers, is that we had a ton of redundancy between the C code and the corresponding ion code for this binding code because you know with some of these structures, um, like update, you know update needs to uh, update this keys struct and blah 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 blah. There's all this redundancy b between the declarations and the ion code and the C code. Um, and keeping those manually in sync is one of the uh, one of the issues with most kinds of foreign binding code. Um, the way it works now is that basically noir uh, noir.ion is almost like a header file for the library itself, meaning this is actually the way things are set up currently. This is not mandatory. You could you could have done foreign on all of these and then redefined them completely in the C code manually and just kept them in sync. You're you're now on the hook for keeping them in sync. 
although the C compiler is going to help you a little bit uh, for certain kinds of mismatches. But, um, but, but, but the way we've set things up now, this is basically like a header file for the C code in the sense that um, if I go look at the ion file, all of these types, enums, and constants are fully defined here. And so um, then in the internal definitions of, of the binding code in, I guess, main.h, main.c, the main.c code just includes the noir.c and then the SDL code, which is internal, not exposed to the ion side at all. Um, and then this code here can just use these types. You can see, so first off, it provides a, a definition of this, uh, what is on the ion side an incomplete type, because it does need to know what, what is inside it. Um, and then it uses constants like, you know, like key return is a constant defined on the ion, a constant defined on the ion side. Um, this keys array is defined on the ion side, and so on. So, you know, it basically, like I think you can see, this basically turns the ion code into a header file. But the benefit of it is now the ion code knows, like any any user code on the ion side that wants to use the library now effectively has the C header as well, right? Like it can see all the declarations, all the function signatures and stuff like that. So um, this is pretty pretty nice for doing this kind of binding code, I think. Um, let me see if there's any other stuff along those lines that I skipped. Just a, there's a bunch of bug fixes and random cleanup. Yeah, added block comments, some error checking for break continue outside of loops. Um, so, I mean, just quickly. Um, stuff like this, like, you know, you, you, you can't break a top, break or continue a top level of a function. You can break inside a loop. You can't continue inside a switch if there's no enclosing loop. You can't continue inside a loop inside a switch, like stuff like that. So basically there has to be some kind of break, break and continue basically have to be in scope of something that binds them, some control flow uh, st structure that binds them. Uh, that's the idea. Um, right. One about implicit breaks. So this is just kind of a, I guess, a teaching tool because we have implicit breaks for our, um, uh, because we have implicit breaks, I guess I don't have the project loaded, so I'm not going to demo it. Um, but, uh, basically if, if you turn this on, this is also the first warning we have uh, actually in the system. If, if you have a break at the end of a block like you wouldn't see, it's going to warn you that it's already implicit, basically. So that's what that is. That is our, that is our inaug inaugural warning in the system. Everything else is an error right now. Um, let's see what else. Incomplete types, already mentioned that. Some bug fixes for C declarations uh, and some more error checking we weren't handling correctly. So yeah, um, I think that's it for the check-ins. But yeah, let me... Um, Right. So um, anyway, if you do before and after on this from, from from the extra stream to what we have now, this is really clean and basically how I want it to be. Um, you can imagine inverting this where, and this is how some systems do it, although it means that you have to do C header file parsing, where you have a he C header file and then the header file is parsed from the ion code and that's how ion gets all the type definitions and function declarations and so on. Um, this is kind of turning that inside out which I think for, for our purposes is definitely uh, the better way to go because we have, we, you know, it's easier to generate C than it is to, uh, to, to interpret it, basically. All right. Um, let me see if there's any questions about that, and then I'll move to, um, to explaining what I want to do today and some of the background. Um, boom, boom, boom. All right. Yeah, so uh, this Noir thing, I mean, what we did last time on stream and what is currently being done, actually, let me demo it just so you can see that it works. Uh, it's obviously not very exciting, but uh, it's always good to see stuff actually working. Uh, and as always, we can, you know, we can do debugging. So we have a window. And uh, anyway, let me just let that free run. And so right now I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just checking when the return key is pressed and released. So it's, it has, the library itself is not only sampling the state of the, all the keys, but it's also doing rising and falling edge detection because, you know, a lot of time in games uh, or other applications, you want both to know the current state, but you also want to know these kind of edge events. 
So anyway, this was just a dumb, a dumb demo. Um, so yeah, so that's just all I was doing, which is not very useful. But um, my my plan for for this library is to essentially become the standard platform for doing our host applications when they have some kind of UI, uh, like graphical UI or graphics rendering or audio or any kind of high-end multimedia stuff. Uh, Noir is essentially going to become our standard library for that, um, for doing our own, like it's not going to be the official ION library necessarily, but it's going to be kind of what we use. And uh, I want to just give a little bit of context on kind of the genesis of it, because it's going to be pretty heavily inspired by uh, ideas from an old library I did, which was uh, written on stream a few years ago. And so um, I linked the videos below. Uh, this was a Win32 only library. So it was showing how to basically write things completely from scratch on Win32, for better or worse. Uh, we won't be doing that because we'll be using SDL just in order to get platform cross-platform compatibility and compatibility testing uh, out of the box without worrying about all that stuff. But uh, aside from the whole from scratch thing um, on, on Win32, I think the big um, the big distinction is really not so much in that, it's more about the API itself. Um, and let me just give an idea of what that looks like. The basic idea of the API is to not be so function heavy and be more state heavy, or not really state, but like, I guess state, but be more kind of data oriented rather than function oriented, for lack of a better word. Um, and so the idea is, you know, for these kind of frame based applications where every frame you do some stuff, you push some data to the, to the operating system, like here's the new frame buffer, um, here's the new size for the window, stuff like that, these various things you want to communicate. And also you get some stuff back from the OS, like here's the current state of all the keys on the keyboard, here's the latest text the user typed in on the keyboard, here's the current time, here's whatever, like the current state of the gamepad, all of these different things. Um, rather than kind of micromanaging that data flow with a lot of small functions for pushing and pulling that data, let's just do it as a big once a frame transaction where we push all our data to the API and we get all the latest data back. And then during, you know, be between those sample points or push pull points, we're essentially just reading the data and preparing our own data to push uh, in the next frame. Um, and so this, uh, one of the results of this philosophy, I guess it's not a necessary corollary, but um, it kind of fits in pretty well, is that um, it's, it's very convenient to just have kind of redundant representations of a lot of that sample data. Um, so rather than, for example, suppose you're sampling the current time or something like that from the API, uh, and you, you, know, you want to use some high precision tick counter. Uh, sure, you can have the integer tick amount, but you can also have it converted into nanoseconds, milliseconds, and microseconds. And oh, not only do you have the current time, but you also have the delta time since last time you uh, updated the API. Uh, and again, you can have all this stuff and you can even have seconds. So even though this is a low resolution representation and even you can have absolute seconds, but again, you know, normally you wouldn't want to use say absolute seconds as your time representation, but sometimes it's very convenient when you're just doing an, a UI or something like that. Um, but by having this not as a sort of authoritative state, but just as a just as a transformed uh, version of the authoritative state, you can have all these kind of things easily available where the user can just kind of access the piece of data they want when they want it, uh, what's convenient for them. Um, and so that's kind of replicated across the board. Like um, even the simple example I gave here with, um, you know, rather than just providing the current state of a key, automatically doing the edge detection and providing that in fields that are named something kind of evocative like pressed and released, even that is an example of that philosophy. Uh, of just providing that data in a readily available way. Uh, and that's, you know, it's the same for gamepad, uh, both digital and analog buttons. It's sort of the same for the mouse button, right? They use the same structure to do this, to both store the current state and to store the, the edge events um, and so on and so on. Um, yeah, and an example of um, of the kind of bidirectional communication that you can do with this API style as well is that some variables um, 
in this big, ultimately in this big kind of state struct that, that maintains the API state can be used for bidirectional communication. So for example, um, the API can tell you the current position of the window, but you can also tell it the current position of the window by just writing the position of the window. So this is kind of like a state synchronization approach rather than a event driven, I want to get the current position of the window. I want to set the current position of the window. Instead, everything is like state synchronization once a frame. That's kind of the model. Um, and um, you'll notice in, in this specific API, although it's not necessary, there's no master event queue. Um, basically, the event queue under the hood is kind of demultiplexed and parsed into different specific data representations. Like, for example, uh, this text. Uh, variable here is basically a concatenation of all the characters that were typed in this frame, but it's just an null terminated C string. So you can also just treat it as a C string rather than having to manually, you know, process the chars and, and, you know, for example, if you're doing like pretty much any time you're anyway, so you can do that sort of thing where you're transforming from a linear stream of events into these kind of split up demultiplexed, uh, type specific representations. So I think one difference from what we did here is that while these representations will be available in Noir, I do plan to at least eventually have a fully faithful time ordered non uh, non demultiplexed version of the event queue because there are cases and applications where you really do need to know the very very fine grain ordering of events in order to do the correct thing. But uh, most of the time you really don't. Um, and so uh, having that data available is great, but also having it available in more convenient forms when you don't want to do everything in strictly time order fashion is even better. So um, just a whirlwind tour of this. If, if you go back and watch my, my old streams, uh, which are pretty long, um, then I think you'll see me talk a lot more about the rationale. Uh, I think most of the ideas still hold up really well uh, as an API design. It's just that I think they need to be augmented with some of more traditional event queues and stuff if, if you want them to be generally usable for any kind of application. But even with an event queue, I think you still want this kind of data as well uh, for convenience. Um, all right. So again, this was all implemented with direct Win32 stuff, which is pretty painful. We're going to be using SDL, which should be a lot less painful and also automatically cross-platform. But that was the genesis. And when, when trying to decide what to put into, like what features and sort of what way, how, what concepts uh, to put into Noir, I'm going to be kind of referencing what I did in Mew uh, as a baseline for a lot of stuff. But anyway, that's the background for why this stuff probably looks a little bit different from what you've seen before in other platform APIs. Um, all right. Let's see here. All right, so uh, so where to get started? Um, so right now we're let's see. So right now we just have some basic keyboard stuff. Um, uh, one of the pretty convenient things about um, let me actually see what SDL does for this. Let's start by doing all the keyboard stuff since we already kind of uh, did, the, did the first piece of that. Um, the th thing I want to look at is basically my plan for this keys array is that this, the same key array will contain uh, versions of things both for virtual key codes and for scan codes and probably even for um, for some things like uh, what do you want to call it? Um, like it would be nice if, and I, I kind of I exploited this in Mew based on the fact that virtual key codes on Windows for uh, for uh, alpha alphabetic characters are upper uh, are uppercase ASCII equivalents. So you could do stuff like, um, you know, you could do stuff like this basically, rather than having to always do, um, I don't know, something like this. Uh, so that's kind of a convenient thing. But for now, let's just uh, do it more manually. Let's see what they say about key code.
This is for the modifier keys. So uh, we were currently using, from last time, let me see here. We were currently using get keyboard state, which when I looked at it afterwards, it doesn't seem to give you events related to the modifier keys, so shift, control, alt, and so on. Um, and uh, we, we will definitely want to represent those as a separate key. Um, so we need to we need to check out that. Um, and you can also do virtual keys for this stuff. Like, do they already do virtual keys? Okay, they already do. It looks like. Um, so let's just do a few examples like that just to get started. Um, Probably rename this. It's getting very confused with all these uh, different main files. Yeah, so now it's not even going to the to the right thing. All right. Um, let's see. So probably modifier keys. We kind of want to hard code since they're using these uh, bit flags. Let's see. Maybe not hard code completely. So, um, let's call them mods. Um, let's see here. It's the best way to do that. I guess, I mean, you can just. Really, just called kmod. Is it not sdl underscore kmod? That seems odd. Does that work? That's bizarre. Why is that not prefixed? Everything else they do is prefixed. All right. Um, let's see how many are there. One, two, three, four, five, six. Let's just do those for now. Um, so let's say SDL mod masks. 32s. Um, What did I call it over here? So it was like key L shift. I'm going to reverse these fields. Okay. 
Visual Studio is so freaking brain dead about indenting anything involving uh, curly braces in an initializer or compound literal context. Um, which drives me nuts on a daily basis. Really shouldn't be so hard. Let's do this at the end. L shift, R shift, L control, R control, L alt. Okay. Oh. Um. here So not currently down and was down last frame. Oh, it's not key. It's key kind, I guess. So I'll probably rename these while I'm at it. Um, let's call these digital button, and I'll call this key. Um, Okay, let me just proofread that in my head. Get the current modifiers, iterate all of, our, all of these. Um, let's get the mask, look at this. as a map since it's really a mapping. Okay, let's see from the ion side whether we can use this for something like um, let's remove this. Or actually, let, let, let me leave it. Um, but I'm just gonna yeah, I mean we can do that too. Uh, L shift key. You know, something like this. Okay, so it's detecting something. 
interestingly, the, <laughs> the right shift is giving me the pressed message. My left shift is, when I'm holding it down, is giving me the release. So I, I guess I'm just maybe misinterpreting the mod state. Um, I'm using L, not the combined mask, right? So key and then mask. So we get the mask, um, look at. So the Boolean check should already convert it to a non zeroness check. Then we find the corresponding key. We look whether it was down. Actually, let me just go and look at what these things actually are. Yeah, so these are bit masks. Um, this is what I would expect. Um, what are people saying? Uh, so, so, so I may interact with the stream more than usual uh, if I'm just doing this sort of thing. Uh, someone's asking about why stuff is written in C rather than ION. Basically, my answer is the stuff that's tightly interfacing with SDL is going to be written in C because otherwise I have to export a ton of functions from SDL. And in particular, I may have to export not just constants, not just functions, but constants, including preprocessor defines, including struct definitions. So I will probably refactor stuff later. Um, like, for example, maybe some of, some of this stuff like this, this is generic code for updating a digital button state. Um, this is probably it belongs in ION, but uh, anything that's directly involved with talking to the foreign API uh, is more convenient to have in C so that I can just do the pound and flute and get it that way. Um, but some of this stuff will probably will potentially move into ion and my plan is to do all of the value added stuff in ion for even for noir and so it's it's mostly just the 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 sdl specific binding and translation code that's going to be in c for that reason does that make sense oh two l shifts in the array oh i see what you're saying i'm just stupid um So that works. So it's okay. Um, and we should also do these virtual combination keys. So let me do those as well. Um, Uh, under the hood, these are actually not true, you know, single bit masks. These are multi bit masks, but um, because they're ORed together, they behave kind of as a virtual thing where, well, I'll, I'll show you in a sec when I demo it, or at least it should. Otherwise, we'll have to implement that behavior ourselves. Um, Now you can 
well, actually, let me let me, put, let me show this demo for um, So you can see when I press left shift, I get both events and I get both released. Same for the right. I get my right shift event and I also get the other one. Now, let me try combinations. Suppose I first, I first press left and I then press right. Shift is already pressed, so I don't get another event for that. Now I release left and I still haven't gotten a shift released event because I'm still holding the right one. And then I release right and both of them are released. So this is not some sort of crazy thing, it's really just synthesizing a key state from oring together the two key states uh, for, for left and right uh, versions of the same key. But this is typically what you want in an application because sometimes you care about just the left key, sometimes you care about any shift key, right? Um, so nothing, <laughs> nothing fancy, but just wanted to point that out. And uh, so it's good that SDL does the right thing there. Um, All right, so that's it for the special modifier keys. <clears throat> I wonder if I can do the alphabetic thing so I don't have to create redundant. I, you know, I, I kind of don't like having to do all the freaking all the keyboard keys have their own, you know, uh, and, and uh, it would be nicer to just use the, uh, say, the lowercase ASCII as the canonical represent, representation of that key. Um, so let me see if I can translate a scan code or a key code to a character. Maybe this one. Oh, here we go. So I will probably do this once at startup. Um, like I'll build a table for doing the mapping. And so, um, let's see. So SDL key code, uh, ASCII to char to SDL key, and it's going to be zero initialized. Um, then we're going to have a function, and it's basically going to um, Then we're going to say do this, uh, and then say SDL key. Because I should check what the return value is in case there's some abnormal behavior here. 
that's the LK unknown. Okay, that's just zero. Since we're using scan codes right now, I'm going to do a translation there as well. Do scan code. Get scan code. And name. Okay, so get that. Actually, we'll just call it scan code in this context. Ambiguity. Um, then I guess you would do. Maybe it'll just be, I mean, this is, this is a little bit crazy, but um, let, let's just try something like this. Um, maybe we say if it's printable, so it's not, not feeding a totally random garbage. See if that works. Okay. Go over them if it's printable. Make a temp string. Call this thing. Verify it's not garbage. Um, let's move it up some of these things to be more correct. Um, okay, something like this.
Um, let's see. Okay, so I think what I want to do. Fortunately, the way I'm doing enums now, I don't really have a way to do that. Um, maybe I'll use constants, which I think is fine anyway. Um, Really should use enums for this. But we don't support. Um, Explicit initializers right now because it interferes with resolving. Okay, let me just do it this way because most of mo almost all of it will be. Um, actually, I think this is better to write out anyway. Um, Control, shift control. So we already did. Too many initializers. Oh, the array is not large enough. Is that a bug in the generated code, I wonder? PL shift. Looks good to me. Um, let's see. Oh, it's because of this thing. God, C is so bad about um, C is so bad about um, if it doesn't, if you don't have a definition for a symbol, it will just make assumptions, right? Like it will assume things are ints, for example, and stuff like that. 
All right, let's see if that still works. Oh, because we didn't change any intended behavior. Okay. Um, but now I want to be able to call this bad boy. Let's see when it actually hits something printable. So this is a space. We have some space character. Well, I guess really what we want to do there is just say, if it has a meaning, Put it in there. Sorry. So yeah, let's look at something that does resolve. And that's a pound key, non-US hash. See, that's not really, okay, let me set breaking there just to see what other cases are hit. It's not really, I mean, I think it's probably okay to have some of those guys, but the stuff I really care about is like, yeah, comma and all this stuff. All right, so let, let's just stick all that in there. Um, okay, and then This is this really you really just want to stick that in there, right? Now you should be able to do stuff like Yep, so that works. So that way we prevent having to do a ton, um, a ton of, what do you want to call it, um, enums, we, when you can just use the ASCII equivalents. That's how I've always liked it, personally. All right. Let's see here. All right. Um, let me just verify that my list does count that. So I think that's reasonable. Um, I think I'm going to stick some of these things into separate functions already. See how bad it is at indenting these initializers. It's incredible. It's embarrassing. All right. Um, so that's it for basic keys for key, for uh, sort of frame frame oriented processing of keys. And so what do we have? Uh, well, we should add more specific. Uh, we should add more specific things like space. Um, Backspace. Uh, 
tab. Caps is actually a modifier key. It should probably be in here. This is why you want to have enums. This will probably push me to actually probably do enums, so I don't uh, or proper enums with explicit initializers, so I don't have to deal with this crap. Um, the caps caps is a modifier. Um, of course, the other option is the the iota, whatever they call it in. Uh, Go where you can do an implicit a, a last constant plus one kind of deal, but we have enums, so we should make those work. All right, so let's see what other keys. Just looking at my keyboard here. Tab caps space arrows. Um, Oh, why am I doing it this way? Sorry. I'm apparently shitty at counting. We don't need to have bit masks. We can just do it like this. Um, Zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Um, Sorry for this manual counting. This is going to be a good motivation for me to actually make it more convenient. Left, right. Um, Okay, so what was the new stuff we added? We added caps for the modifiers. Um, I think this is already defined, right? And then for this stuff, we added these. I guess I need to get, yeah. Actually, let's not add everything, but let's just add. I, I just realized page up, page down, insert, delete, all those things. But um, let's just start with a set. So it's not completely anemic, but it's also not complete. Um, turn space, tab, left, right, up, down. I could use a macro to keep those in sync, but um, let's be all manual.
Okay, okay, okay. So let's say that's it for keys for now, although there's more to do in terms of rounding it off. Um, and I want to move this into an enum eventually. Um, let's do... Next, we should probably do some basic stuff around window management. So, in Mew, I had a main window. That's how that stuff was handled, which was sort of implicitly created, um, which in a lot of cases is a good model, but I didn't have a way to do multiple windows, which is always going to be needed eventually, even though most apps I do are, are single window. Um, but I still think that having something along those lines can be a pretty good idea. So maybe what we'll do... Well first, actually, let's start moving this into a struct rather than having it be totally global. Um, maybe like this. And then all of this sort of updated state will go in there. Step one. Um, and I guess um, okay, so let's go and look at the mu code. What else would be interesting to put in there for starters? Okay, maybe put in some mouse stuff. Actually, let's do some of the window things first. Actually, let's do the quit. The quit is pretty important. Um, so this is just a flag that signals whether a quit event was signaled. And the way that works, I have to just rebuild to regenerate the structure, for the C code. Uh, the way it works is we will have some kind of update events. Um, I'm just going to pump the event queue. So is called type. It's not an enum, so the autocomplete does not. It's not available. Uh, I do think, though, that um, the easiest thing we could do would be to just say if event type equals SDL quit, which I think is what in case that enum is called, uh, then we're just going to set quit to true. Oh, okay, so it's a value struct. Okay. 
Um, so let's say something like this instead. So now the app actually exits. Um, should also have an init flag. And the way the init will work is that because everything is zero initialized by default, it will not be initialized by default. Um, then we can set this to true. We can also do make it item potent. Um, And actually, in general, you don't necessarily want to do this. Um, I'll talk about how we how we do error handling in this API style in a bit. Um, but let's see if not more init. This is just uh, initting the first time, which. Can be dangerous depending on what that entails, but for convenience, I actually think it's worth it. Uh, you just need a mechanism for. I mentioned in an old stream that one of the error reporting styles that I like is sticky errors, and sticky errors is actually the model I used in Mio, which is going to be, I think, applicable here too. Um, but for now, we'll be cavalier about it. Actually, remove it. Actually, let's not let's not do that. Um, I think a fatal error of some sort. Mm, let's not do that. Actually. Okay, what do we want to do? Um, Think how I want to handle it.
first let's just make sure that works and then we'll make sure the errors actually trigger oh so this has to go on the server of course it's an error i'm not checking okay and then close it closes um i should be Okay, so if I now move this out of order, well, checking window, but window is now null. And um, if I look at noir, error is non zero, and there's an error string. Okay. Okay. Let's see here. So we have some kind of checking for quitting and whether it's initialized and we have some basic error stuff with error codes and an auxiliary uh, oh yeah i forgot this is a better way to do it uh, where you can use static strings for most things um, so where's the on code oh it's here so basically the idea is that if you have a buffer um, and then you have a pointer. And you're never really supposed to use the buffer directly. You're supposed to use the string directly. Um, so in cases like this, you can just use, don't have to use stir copy. It's really only when you need to construct something dynamic. And so the idea is, if you want to construct a dynamic thing for the error message, you want to communicate something from a third party API's error message, you want to copy that into your own error string as part of something else, maybe. Um, the idea is that you would use the buffer for that, and then you would point the string to the buffer. But the error string is what you're always supposed to be looking at, basically. Um, Okay. 
So actually, let's get rid of the buffer for now because I don't want to put it in until we need it. Most of the time, these uh, hard-coded messages are sufficient. All right. Um, and in fact, I mean, the convention I used in Mu, which is maybe fine, actually. Yeah. For now, let's not even do distinct error codes, which I got to, I mean, this may need to be added eventually. Um, but actually, let's just do it the way I did it in Mu, which is kind of a little bit more uh, elegant when you can pull it off, which is you do it like this, and then it's a null pointer if there's no error. All right, um, let's move on to the next piece. I'm going to be doing extra streaming today, uh, so maybe I should stop it right now. Let me just make sure everything still works. And uh, Okay, uh, let, let me just see if there's any questions and then I'll stop recording and start recording again for the extra stream. But I'll, I'll be continuing basically just implementing some subset of new stuff. Um, so today, uh, in the extra stream, I think we'll be able to do a very large chunk of all the Mu code. Even though the Mu code took a long time to write, it should be much easier here because things mostly just work in SDL, unlike Win32. Um, so mouse, gamepad, window resizing, um, probably some audio would be fun, uh, maybe OpenGL, although we need to do a bunch of scaffolding for that. Um, but probably, no, probably not OpenGL. I was planning on doing a higher level GPU type thing, like uh, Flow's so-called graphics. Um, so probably we won't expose DL directly for now. But uh, but all the other stuff we'll do today, hopefully. Anyway, let me see what's uh, what people are asking. Um, let's see here. Someone's asking, what's the plan for imports in ION? Um, I'm working on that in parallel, but haven't checked it in. But basically, we have a package system, and it works much like Go, where, or I mean, other languages, where the directory hierarchy is basically the package hierarchy from the system's point of view. All the, all the .ion files in a given directory, except for ones that are excluded based on convention, like uh, prefix dot or prefix underscore, or things that have a certain platform specific tag that gets included or excluded depending on the platform. Other than that, all the ion files in the directory corresponding to a package are implicitly part of that, so it's a convention over configuration thing. And that works due to out of order declarations. And then you import something and you can choose to I mean you can choose to do everything explicitly prefixed. You can rename the package locally if you want to have a shorthand for the prefix. You can import specific symbols. You can even import all of the symbols. So um, it's not going to be very dogmatic about namespace uh, hygiene if you want to be sloppy about importing everything from a namespace. But uh, that's the that's the plan, and I'm working on it in parallel, but didn't have it ready for this stream. So I, I, I am just doing everything in one file for now. Uh, the main reason I punted on some of it is because I need to do cross-platform directory code, which is not hard, but it's, you know, I have to do it and test it. Um, anyway, so yeah, that's the plan there. Someone's asking why are we adding key cons versus using an enum. The, the, the reason is just that uh, th this is another to-do item, but enums right now can only be sequential. Um, there's no explicit initializers due to an annoying thing. That's a temporary state of affairs implementation thing that I need to figure out about how to do well. But basically, due to the out-of-order declarations and the way it sorts declarations, there's a little bit of a of an issue with enums. It would actually be easy to resolve if I treated all the enum constants as being completely standalone constants on the C side. Um, but as long as I am synthesizing enums on the ion side to enums on the C side, there are additional restrictions on ordering. They have to basically be linear. 
uh, or more linear otherwise. Um, as a stopgap on the C side, I may just explode out the constants for an enum into standalone constants so they can be arbitrarily sorted. Um, that should actually be fine. So maybe I should do that. And I think having to do all this manual numbering <laughs> may push me over the edge to do that, but uh, I have been punting on it a little bit. Um, so that's the reason for that. This is manual. Um, if you're converting it to a while not loop, do you not need to put continue after each if blocks? What do you mean here? No. I mean, if I didn't want to check the other ones, but multiple keys can be pressed at once. I'm not really sure what you mean. I was using an infinite for loop before, and now I'm... Yeah. Anyway, I think this works. Shouldn't be an issue. Update can return false under two conditions, uh, both of which are cases that should, you know, like it's sort of assuming that you're calling this potentially in an infinite loop. So false is going to do, you know, either if the thing has quit or if it had a failure that you are not, like the kind of a, you know, for example, it hasn't been initialized at all, or whatever, in which case you, you know, you can't really recover from that within the loop. So it returns false in that case. Um, someone's asking about sticky errors. By sticky errors, I just basically mean something like what we're doing here, where an error occurs, there's usually some proximate um, yes or no kind of indication, like a bool, and then it sets a sticky error, which just means it's there until you set it back to null, basically. So it's like Arano in C standard library, but non-global, or rather, I mean, it's kind of global, but it's specific to the API. So that's the idea. So you can typically see the error using a bool, but then you have to go and, and it'll stick around until it gets overridden by another error or someone resets the error to, to null to signal that they've recovered from the error. <coughs> Excuse me. So that's the idea behind sticky errors. And there's a bigger, there's a bigger <laughs> philosophy around how to design APIs to deal well with sticky errors. Uh, for us, it will mostly be good. Like, or for us, it will mostly uh, not be a big issue for this kind of API. Um, right. Uh, and someone earlier was also asking whether I'll be checking this in. I think, uh, yeah, I will be checking this in today, uh, even though you have to do a bunch of wrangling on your own end to make sure you have SDL installed and that you use the right compiler flags in order to set the include directories, the library directories, and actually provide the linker directives for uh, linking the static libraries for the importers. Um, but yeah, I will be checking it in, but you'll have to do some, it'll be less turnkey for the compilation than what you're used to until I do a cross-platform build setup for it. Um, all right. I think uh, that's it for the mainstream. I will stop recording and then re-enable and continue on the extra stream. So see everyone, see, see everyone from the mainstream next time.